O God, the creator and sustainer of the universe, look with favor upon this new center of trade, of commerce, and of culture. Give guidance, protection, and a right judgment to all who work and live here. Listening to it now, the World Trade Center's 1973 benediction sounds like a eulogy. The magnitude of this city's loss has been matched only by the intensity of its response. We're not only going to rebuild, we're going to come out of this stronger than we were before. That is a burial site. How can we build on top of those souls? There are areas where they know that they have bodies which we can't get until we alleviate some of the debris on that pile. Nobody stops the job. Not in the morning, not in the afternoon, not at night. And this new space that would sit on this site is a dramatic way of rebuilding this building. And that's going to be how we rejuvenate Lower Manhattan. You know these builders don't care for me, you, or anybody else that comes with it but themselves. We have a lot of interests here. A lot of people that need to be satisfied. That these may become examples of our concern for world justice and the growing acknowledgement of the interdependence of all nations. God bless them and God keep them. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Funding for this program was provided by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, which seeks to enhance public understanding of the role of technology in society and portray the lives of the men and women engaged in scientific and technological pursuit. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Aunt Sophie. Happy birthday to you. Funding was also provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. The physical void in Manhattan's skyline mirrors the emotional void that we have all felt in our lives since September 11th. Even today, a year later, we still find it difficult to move beyond that horrible day. And perhaps we never will move beyond it. Today, we hear about plans for a memorial and office buildings. But getting to this point has required a courageous effort by thousands of people. First, to recover loved ones and move a mountain of debris from ground zero. And next, to determine what should take its place. What follows is an intimate diary of that painful process. It shows that no matter how complex or difficult, we as Americans have begun to rebuild. For three weeks after the attack, rescue workers searched for survivors. Then they gave up hope of finding anyone alive. By today's count, 2,819 people were lost, most still buried within the rubble. Beyond Ground Zero, the city mourned. But at the 16-acre site, there was little time for tears. So we can't really load up anything down there? Yes, we Workers vowed to recover the dead. They would labor in this hell for nine long months. On the morning of September 11th, Shortly after I got to City Hall, I'd say about 9.30, I called Regional Scaffold 
And at that point in time, I thought all I needed was some scaffolding and netting and, and uh, some sidewalk bridging, because all I saw was that a, a plane had hit the building and there were going to be some, some hazardous um, structural elements hanging off the building. And I knew I'd need to protect the public from walking in and around the, the Trade Center complex, never realizing that the, the towers would actually collapse. The Trade Center complex had consisted of seven buildings. The attack on the Twin Towers destroyed all of them. The South Tower was the first to fall. The Marriott Vista Hotel was crushed. A half an hour later, the North Tower collapsed. World Trade Centers 4, 5, and 6 were left standing, but damaged beyond repair. World Trade Center 7 fell after burning for seven hours. after the initial disaster. The mayor was here, and the mayor asked me, um, how long is this going to take to clean up? I said, I'm not sure when we'll finish, but some of my initial goals is actually to get building four, five, and six demolished and down to grade by the end of the year. Just north of the site, the city turned an evacuated elementary school into a command center. When I walked in there, I saw a whole bunch of lunch boxes in the corridors, but lunch boxes and, and coats. You get into their classrooms, and you saw the little kids' arts and crafts and what have you. It bothered all of us. Your thoughts start coming. You're wondering about these kids. Did anything happen to them? It was funny. We used to have meetings in these little chairs and little tables, you know? Basically, if we knock down this facade or part of it, we can just continue. Boom, 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 boom. But we did the job from there. We did the lion's share of the job from that school. Basically, we were there for all the agencies to interact with one another and to set up logistically. I mean, the city just threw everybody, all its agencies, all its resources in a room and said, get us out of here. Before the 11th, New York City's Department of Design and Construction built museums and firehouses, playgrounds and libraries. Clearing ground zero was an assignment like none before. We're a government agency essentially for capital projects. I mean, we're not in rescue and recovery operations. Mario, we have uh, some uh, fire hose out here. Directly in front of the bank of trust, right in the pit. Nobody's prepared for this. Two thousand three hundred workers chipped away at the mountain of steel and concrete. They had two million tons to clear. They removed as many as eight hundred truckloads of debris each day. It was crazy here. Complete bedlam. People running all over the place. Machines going all over the place. I think I've lost some of my hearing. working that from the top as well. We had to get more organized. 
And that's actually when I divided up the site into four quadrants. And I gave each one of the construction managers control and responsibility to manage that sector. Nobody stops the job. Not in the morning, not in the afternoon, not at night. It was very difficult to coordinate from a question of safety and from a question of efficiency. People had to know what the other guy was thinking about. When the tower fell, it punched right through that area. We just want to know the extent of that damage. We were encountering different situations every couple of hours. I mean, it was dangerous conditions. Recovery crews led cadaver dogs through the rubble to pick up the scent of the missing. Debris was trucked off site to nearby barges and then shipped to a landfill where it was searched once again. This grim routine repeated itself daily at Ground Zero. Both demolition site and mass grave. New York developer Larry Silverstein signed a 99-year lease on what was to be the crown jewel of his real estate empire, the World Trade Center Twin Towers. Now he's front and center in the debate over whether the area should be rebuilt. Now, it's, it's so hard to even ask these questions while the work continues on the site, but what should happen? My first reaction is to think about over 5,000 people <clears throat> who are still missing. Uh, the families uh, of those people, the tragedy, the magnitude of it. Um, However, I firmly believe that we should rebuild. Larry Silverstein was required to rebuild by the terms of his lease with the site's owner, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. A powerful transportation agency in the metropolitan area, the Port Authority also lost the PATH commuter train station underneath the World Trade Center and 75 of its own employees. First and foremost, uh, we have to plan for a memorial park. Uh, once that is identified, we can then look at what uh, has to be done on the rest of the site. Now, keep in mind that 12 million square feet of office space was destroyed. Somehow, we had to heal that blight on Lower Manhattan. Major institutions were down there. Immediately said, Larry, please, do whatever you can do to get this thing going. There was a meeting of real estate figures over on Park Avenue, and Larry Silverstein came in, and he declared that he would rebuild the World Trade Center just as it was. Everyone clapped for him, but there was also a murmur, an undercurrent, that maybe Larry should be patient. And we tried to explain to Larry that this was a matter of not only rebuilding, but there are many other things to consider. And we have to have input from the public, especially from the families who lost loved ones. Was there recovery some parts in your sector tonight, earlier? There was a body part recovered on the north east corner and they tried to find more but they brought the dogs in that's why we had to stop the operation on six because they wanted the dogs to be burned yeah, by yeah very parts. early very early in the shift there was a there was a recovery what we have at ground zero is a massive effort trying to help out in the recovery of the missing and at the same time the only way to do the recovery is with these massive machines. These are excavators that weigh 275,000 pounds. 
grapplers are the ones grabbing and doing most of the most of the work. Um, these things can be pretty dangerous if you're standing close to one. When it moves, it swivels. So if anybody's in the way, you can hit. I don't think the hazards were fully understood by some of the people out there in the recovery efforts. The fire and police departments had assigned spotters to look for the dead. But safety regulations limited their numbers to one per excavator and kept each back by at least 50 feet. Many firefighters objected. If you ever really thought about how far 50 feet was, that's a long, long distance. You'd almost need binoculars to be able to see. We get over here, they, they uncover a stairway. Right. Next thing you know, we get invaded with about 25 firemen. Right? I asked, I speak to Chief Vaughn, and right. I say, look, I need your people to back out. Right. right. And this is where we're at. So. Okay. Well, I want those guys out there. It's well, too dangerous. <laughs> Mike wanted them to back off, and they wouldn't. We went up to them, we asked them nicely, listen, could you guys back up? They said no. And buzz off, you know, we're gonna keep, we're gonna stand here. The closer we were, we'd, we'd get that better look, and we'd be able to stop the machine, hopefully before they dug into the remains. At that point in time, I stopped the uh, grappler, because they still refused to leave. What's going on in front of them? They've been there all morning. I radio 1010. I said, listen, chief, you know, you're going to have to back up some of your guys. Somebody's going to get hurt. So they came down. One of the chiefs came down and backed them up. If it was uh, my coworker, my brother in there, I'd be in there digging nonstop. I wouldn't go home. It breaks my heart, but uh, I have to look out for their safety, too. It didn't always go smooth, I can honestly say that. There were times when we butted heads. But, you know, you, you try to come to a reasonable solution. The death and destruction in Lower Manhattan sat squarely in the backyard of its 50,000 residents. They too breathed the smoke of unextinguished fires and struggled with the trauma of seeing the event firsthand. Whatever was built here would affect them dramatically. We were the fastest growing residential neighborhood in all of New York City. We were at our peak before September 11th. We had great schools. We were building new parks. I, I just couldn't believe this. And how did we even start to think about what we needed to do? We have gotten through the worst of it, and now we're ready to start the healing with our rebuilding. Community Board 1 advises the city on what and where to build in Lower Manhattan. This town hall meeting gave residents and others a chance to influence its most significant proposal yet. What should replace the World Trade Center? 
We must make a statement that no terrorists will come here and knock down our buildings and tell us how we're going to live. It's time to rebuild those towers. The lives were lost in a very vibrant, a very powerful, a very energized environment. I think that environment needs to be replaced. There'll be thousands of pieces of mail and then email and phone calls came. And the overwhelming thought was you've got to recreate what was there. We see the Trade Center site every day. Our kids know it very well. And my son asks me every day when Borders is going to be rebuilt. And we need to have a resurrection of shopping, of office buildings, to make the site a little bit more familiar for our kids. It was very discouraging to see how the residents don't take any consideration into the fact that we need to honor those people that were murdered on national TV. And we have to worry about now that the fact that the Borders bookstore is not there and they don't have a bookstore to go to. I understand there's a void now. I understand all that. But those towers are gone. They're done. They are not here. They're not coming back. That is a burial site. Most of us will never get any remains found. How can we build on top of those so I lost my husband. I lost my future. I don't. Ha I won't have children. I won't ever. Have She's a very beautiful young woman who I'm sure will discover that she does have a future as soon as she's had time to properly grieve. But I don't think that necessarily Monica's views are the views of other people. Good evening. My name is uh, Leah Yelpy. My son died in the, in the Trade Center. He was a firefighter. I had a grandiose idea because of what happened, that all 16 acres should be a park, and that was a grandiose idea. There were also people who said, I came here to tell you to not build anything on that 16 acres, but after listening to you, I say, you go get what you need to rebuild your community. And you people have an opportunity here to do something that's really nice. Go for it, and you have the power to do it. Good luck. You see how this debris is still smoking? That's when the fire is going to still burn it. Eight weeks later, we still got fires burning. Every now and then, one of the pieces of equipment will dig in, they'll open up a small area, the oxygen will rush in, and you'll get this plume of brown, black smoke coming up. That's because that fire just got more oxygen. So, I mean, these things are burning. At one point, I think they were about 2,800 degrees. Underground fires, ignited by burning jet fuel, smoldered for months, fed by molten steel and buried carpeting, office furniture, wood paneling, and paper. Workers toiled in bitter smoke and clouds of toxic dust composed of pulverized concrete, fiberglass, and asbestos. The use of explosives to demolish World Trade Centers 4, 5, and 6 was rejected for fear workers would risk their lives entering buildings to set the charges. Construction experts from across the country ran the complicated demolition work. the largest demolition project in the United States. It's one of the largest probably that's ever been done in the world. Automatically realized what a dangerous situation uh, the job presented because it was so many unknowns. You're dealing with over 12 million square feet of structures. It's definitely intimidating at times. In some areas we have structure intact. We have other areas that it's collapsed our way to the lowest basement level. In a normal demolition project, you can see the structure, you can walk through it, you can study each floor, you can study how it's put together, but this one's like a house of cards. You just have to go out there and be around it and you, you study it from a standpoint that it's already down, now how do you get it out?
you build the bridge over and that would clear you on the path too. This this is this is gonna be a problem to you. You're not gonna get this. And the photographs I have just don't show that. Engineers charted Ground Zero's dangerous terrain. More than 400 had worked on the site since the day of the attack. I'm not even worried about him if he just stays in that area. Many had walked this same ground more than 30 years ago to help design the original complex. The site can get you so involved emotionally that the one thing that I think was essential was to approach this more as a technical problem than recognizing that there was the potential for thousands of people to be within this graveyard. When we first looked at the site, we really didn't know how contained the damage was. So we weren't sure whether it would be more widespread or not. The collapse of the Twin Towers sent off shock waves similar to those of a small earthquake and bombarded neighboring buildings with falling steel. Most of the debris that damaged any of the other buildings was pretty much contained within about a block or so off the uh, main plaza area of the World Trade Center. There were five or six buildings uh, that had some really serious structural damage. Engineers surveyed 406 buildings around the site to assess whether they were structurally sound. They might have looked unstable, but they were not at risk of collapse. The pile of debris on the site was a different story. It constantly shifted under the weight of heavy equipment. Hidden within the pile were voids that might swallow up men and machines at any moment. The excavators are sitting on top of a debris pile. It's, it's like a, a pile of, um, you know, when, when you were young, you played with pixie sticks, and, and the pixie sticks are all intertwined, but they're very unstable. And, and, and if you don't touch them, they're stable, but you move one piece and all the pixie sticks could fall. We already lost a couple of grapplers uh, that collapsed. Nobody got hurt, but, you know, they dropped like about 15, 20 feet. They could have dropped 40 feet and somebody could have gotten killed, but no one has gotten killed in, in an operation this big. Yesterday at the 530, there was an area of exclusion sent out to everybody, yeah. all right? Those are areas where we know that there's considerable voids, all right, so no more excavating. Engineers carefully planned the excavation of debris to avert fatal cave-ins and to protect the very foundation on which the World Trade Center had been built. Beneath the Twin Towers lay what engineers called the bathtub, a giant basement as big as eight city blocks and more than 75 feet deep. It contained seven levels of parking lots, maintenance offices, mechanical rooms, and the path, a commuter rail system running under the Hudson River from New Jersey. A three-foot thick concrete retaining wall called a slurry wall kept the Hudson River and groundwater from flooding into the basement. When the towers collapsed, most of the floors that had held the slurry wall in place were destroyed. Unsupported walls shifted. If they caved in, water would fill the bathtub and inundate the path and New York City's subways, flooding them for miles. When excavators dug below street level, they exposed sections of the slurry wall held up only by debris. Engineers searched for ways to remove debris without causing a catastrophic collapse. On the southern end of the site, near the ruined Vista Hotel, workers discovered a vast section of the slurry wall left totally unsupported. 
the grappler operator. He said, Charlie, he goes, uh, I don't think I should go out there. I said, what's the problem? He said, the ground is shaking. And uh, I said, well, let's, you know, back off. Let me get the engineering team down here immediately. We found that the slurry wall was moving just south of the Vista Hotel. These walls are coming in. They moved in about six inches. And this, these walls hold back the river. So if these walls cave in, this place is going to get flooded out by the river. There was sort of a valley sitting out in here between the wall and the south tower. All of the collapse had gone down at the track level. So we had 60, 70 feet of wall, totally unsupported. Engineers would secure the slurry wall using a system of tieback anchors. They drilled steel pipes at an angle into the slurry wall, reaching down as deep as 120 feet to bedrock. Long steel cables were then inserted into the pipes. At times, water burst through the tieback holes without warning, leaving little doubt how effective the slurry wall was in holding back the river. Grout pumped into the pipes cemented the ends of the steel cables into bedrock. The wall was forced back and locked off. Securing the slurry wall was the number one priority on the site. Workers would install hundreds of tiebacks as they descended floor by floor to the lowest level of the basement. Okay, let's go update on the tieback installations just so you know in terms of total numbers. As of this morning, uh, we had 148 tiebacks installed total. Uh, 128 of those are already tensioned and stressed. What's the total number you think we need? I'm estimating 700, 600, 700, depending upon how we make the break. We were doing about four a day. We're down to two a day. Um, the most important thing is actually getting back to where we were at four or five a day. At two a day, we're here nine months from now. I'm not going to be here in nine months. <laughs> None of us are going to be here in nine months, trust me. Enough of the cleanup has been done, we're actually starting to see what the final condition of the site will be when we leave. And the long-term master plan deals with getting New York City not just back to where they were pre-September 11th, but putting us on very good footing for the next 50 years. We have to think about the impacts of a $250 million subway restoration project that actually comes right through the middle of our site. We have to worry about a $500 million path rail line reconstruction and how important that is to the city's economy. We need to do all that infrastructure work now so that we are not competing for real estate when Silverstein most likely will rebuild some buildings on the site. So we're on a very, very short time frame whereby we need a coordinated effort. Between Silverstein, the Port Authority, and the MTA that owns the subways, the question was not only how everyone would work together, but also who would lead. The key figure in terms of power at the World Trade Center site is clearly Governor Pataki. Lower Manhattan, this city, and this state are going to come back and recover stronger than anybody can ever imagine. He appoints board members of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey and the Metropolitan Transportation Authority. So he has more or less control of all these institutions. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Initially, the governor thought that these agencies could come up with a grand design, a grand scheme for Lower Manhattan but it soon became clear that it could not appear as a Pataki political operation. It had to be something with more public involvement. 
The governor and the mayor appointed a board of 11 people to direct the rebuilding process. We now uh, call to order the uh, meeting of the directors of the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation. Call they are mostly business executives and political insiders. Madeline Wills is the only board member who lives downtown. LMDC will not have the power of building these projects, but they will coordinate all interested parties to work together to rebuild what had been destroyed and hopefully better than it was before. LMDC will help distribute more than $21 billion in federal funds to rebuild Lower Manhattan close to two billion for transportation improvements alone. Many consider these improvements long overdue. If you really look at investment in transportation in Manhattan, it's almost all in the last 60 years or 70 years gone to Midtown. This is our chance to restore the balance and have more people coming down so we can get more construction down here so that our office buildings are going to fill up so that we have housing sites down here and we have a vibrant community and that's going to be part of how we rejuvenate lower manhattan lmdc has collaborated with the port authority on a proposal to replace outdated transit connections at the world trade center site we want a terminal more like Grand Central or Penn Station so that we can better integrate all of the subway lines connecting with the paths. It is one of the things that we can do in this framework of infrastructure that really will create an advantage for Lower Manhattan, not the disadvantage that Lower Manhattan has suffered for so many decades. Before building the proposed transportation hub, the Port Authority sought to restore path service to the Trade Center station within two years. I gotta take a couple of photos of these path car numbers while I'm here. All right, let's spend a minute here. 65,000 people had passed through this station every day. A handful of engineers now came to assess the damage. If I were in the World Trade Center today, I would be on the 72nd floor in the northwest corner where my offices were located. I spent my entire career of 29 years in that whole building complex and watched all of Manhattan grow around the World Trade Center. This is the commuters bar and cafe here. We lost a total of 75 people from the Port Authority in that, uh, in that accident. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, some of those people were my very close friends. The B3 parking level. Of all the intact structure in this area, B3 in this corner is is the worst. Uh, I'm not sure where it hits that line over there. Part of our responsibility was going on the ground and mapping uh, areas of intact structure so that we'd understand where the urgent areas for stabilizing the slurry wall were. Uh, slurry wall, right there. Right here. This is the slurry wall. This is the slurry wall. <laughs> the contractor can then follow us and do his work and do the tiebacks. In 1993, you know, after the bombing, I was hired that summer and started work and was down underground helping with the reconstruction. And I was, I was really proud and excited to be a part of it. I felt very American, very much like we just took our best shot. 
uh, we took their best shot and, you know, hardly a scratch. This is completely different in my mind. It's so tragic. Eleven? Yeah. You're not. We're gonna stay together, fellas, okay? If you're gonna head off, just let us know. And we'll send somebody with you. By mid-December, the Department of Design and Construction had leveled World Trade Center buildings four and five. We're getting ready to pull building six. We had to be very careful how we demolished building six. We were worried about the building six coming down and then damaging the, uh, the slurry wall, so we wanted that particular building to fall within a certain area. Well, we've got the cables attached in four different locations going up, and they'll be pulling, pulling the building to the north. It's not every day you try to pull down an eight-story building with cables. Well, I want everybody down to the me. gate. Thank you. I want to 50 feet back past that blue truck. I have one dollar bet. What? You want to bet one dollar that by 230, this will still be standing? Yeah. Okay. I'll take that. I'll take okay. that bet. One dollar. Okay. There's a certain excitement in the air about bringing the last structure down at the World Trade Center. Tough old building. Come on now. This is gonna go quick. Yeah. yeah. If it's if it goes, it'll go quick. Keep it rocking, it'll go. Hey, when we lost the floor, the more you shake it, the more it starts going into failure. There it goes. Good job. Good job. Dan, I'll take my dollar now. <laughs> it was nice doing business with you. <laughs> I'd much rather be involved uh, in what I normally do in building buildings. It's much more useful to actually build something positive and to build a skyscraper and to have a topping off ceremony. And, and when you're done, you have something that people can use. In this case, we're, we're destroying something that was partially destroyed by the terrorists. And there's nothing left, so there's no closure. holiday season, let's make sure we celebrate it with even more enthusiasm this year, just to show them that they can't rob from us the things that are most important in our lives. In regards to your family, we're still Merry Christmas. And all of us at DDC, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Well, the whole Christmas time here was... You know, it brought a lot of people together. I think everybody was thinking about people that lost their relatives there, you know, because it was the first Christmas without them. We can all pat each other in the back for doing a good job. But these people have to live with this pain forever. I finally got the courage and the strength to go to Ground Zero because I owed it to Michael to be, to try to connect with him. You can't even describe the feeling of, of seeing what I saw. because 
There's nothing there. In my mind, I put the towers there on the site, and I saw my husband working on the 84th floor, and he was happy. I said, I have to make sure, you know, that we honor those lives, and that was why I started my mission. Monica Eichen wanted all 16 acres to be used for only one purpose, a memorial. Her goal seemed unattainable until it received a surprising endorsement. Mayor Giuliani originally said we should be putting office space and try to mix it in with the memorial. And then he went and took a helicopter ride and it changed his whole view. Being up high, he saw the enormity of what happened. I really believe we shouldn't think about this site as a site for economic development. We've got to think about it from the point of view of a soaring, beautiful memorial. And, um, and then if we do that right, if we do that part right, then the economic development will just happen. Then millions of people will come here and you'll have all the economic development you want and you can do the office space in a lot of different places. And I feel very, very strongly about this. This touched off a storm of very hushed criticism. The community people, the real estate industry, and various politicians were afraid that he would become a lightning rod for the families of the victims, and that they would all congeal around a single position. You know, they must not build. felt from the beginning that if I can get the voices to get louder, if I keep going out, um, I can get families uniting and being a constructive voice. I had a nice brunch in Long Island, thanks to one of the family members who lost her son. She opened up a restaurant to other family members. We had a nice group come out. It's so touching to see how we as families can really interact with one another and express how we feel. This is very important that we all come together. It affects everyone. I think it's very helpful to be able to connect. I'm really opposed to a reconfiguration of the World Trade Center. I, that's not what I want to see. I'd like to see a park and a playground. I'd like somewhere to be able to take my kids, uh, somewhere people can reflect. That's my cemetery. That'll be my place where I feel that's where my son was last, and I could sit there at my son's birthday, the holidays. If I want to go and stay 10 hours there, it's my business, but I have somewhere to go. They wouldn't build buildings on top of a cemetery, would they? No, right? What we want, we're going to have to really fight for it because when it comes to money and it comes to anything else, you know these builders don't care for me, you, or anybody else that comes with it but themselves. It doesn't make any sense, and the families are starting to really realize that if we felt that our voices weren't being heard, we would come out and form a human chain before they do anything. Monica Eichen and a small group of victims' families met with World Trade Center leaseholder Larry Silverstein to plead their case. Their attitude was, got to be another place you could build. Got to be, the mayor suggested before he left office, that, that don't build on the site, find some other acreage on the west side of Manhattan or whatever. He is a builder. He obviously has a lot at stake. 50,000 people living in lower Manhattan desperately want the place to be rebuilt. The shopkeepers, thousands of shopkeepers want it to be rebuilt. The major corporations downtown desperately want it to be rebuilt. They said they understood that and they agreed, provided we didn't build on that 16-acre site. I would have hoped that he could have understood a little more about how we were feeling and about the importance of the memorial and how difficult it will be for us if they just rebuild Path cars and they're looking to uncouple the cars. We thought about trying to collect 
some remnants of the trade center that might be used for either a, uh, a memorial, a museum, or whatever may come. If we could get a path car out, that would be great. When they rehab them, they made a little lighter, so they vary between 62,000 and 65,000 pounds. So. Each car, and it's quite heavy, so you needed a crane. So what we did is we welded a piece of track onto where the tracks ended. And we were able to pull the cars out slightly more into daylight so that we could actually then reach down with a crane. And then we were able to pull them out one at a time. Uh, be advised that they're going to be uh, taking a pad train out at this time, Copy. Knowing that it was going to be a very long time for the permanent memorial to be established, the mayor and I looked into putting up a temporary memorial, and uh, he instructed me to give him some ideas. So I went to the Port Authority and literally got a book of um, archived materials that had been saved from the World Trade Center. And went through them with an engineer. It was quite obvious that that sphere, the damaged sphere, was the obvious choice. The sphere, a 27-foot high steel and bronze sculpture, had sat atop a granite fountain in the World Trade Center Plaza. After the attack, it was moved to what resembled a triage for injured building parts at John F. Kennedy International Airport. Here, the Port Authority safeguarded relics of the World Trade Center for possible integration into a memorial. They wanted us to go out and look at it and see whether it was, there was anything salvageable. How damaged is it? How much of the internal skeleton is still intact? How much of it is still intact inside the base? I don't know how they got it here, but getting it where we've got to take it and having it there in the same condition it is today is going to be a trick. It's, it's pretty ripped up, but we're taking some measurements and we got some ideas how we can lay it out. Based on what I had seen at the site, yes, it was possible to put it together. For us, the next step is to take the object uh, and the proposed locations to our families committee. Representatives of the families demanded that the LMDC place the sphere close to their private viewing platform at Ground Zero. But the neighboring community of Battery Park City laid claim to the nearest open space. There are thousands of people who use this small space as a place for the kids to go out and play. Trying to sell this particular place for a temporary memorial was not going to be a slam dunk. We have a lot of interests here, a lot of people that need to be satisfied. Would you like to introduce yourselves? Monica Eichen, September's Mission founder. It's important that we establish temporary memorials because we are not going to have anything for a long time. We have nowhere to go. I don't have an urn. I don't have a coffin. I have nothing. We're here representing the over 1,000 people that have signed petitions in Battery Park City against any more of these kinds of memorials on our very small plot of land. You are faced with the relative's viewing platform. You make a left, you are faced with the temporary teddy bear memorial. Then you go to the temporary police fireman memorial with tons of tourists. Then you have the permanent police memorial. For God's sakes, give us a break. They were complaining about the foot traffic of, of just a couple of tourists in their neighborhood. And I could just see what's going to happen when a memorial comes. I don't know what they're going to do when they realize how many tourists are going to be coming into their area. Thankfully, I didn't lose anyone that I, that I loved. 
But if I did, I would, and I didn't live there, I would have the option to come to the memorial on my own terms right. when I was ready for it. When I live, when I look out on it, I don't have that option. It's there all right. the time. We've been patient, patient, patient. Now we're getting angry. Enough is enough. We're going to give you a problem. You put it there. People are sending me emails. They're ready for civil disobedience. What a horrible embarrassment this would be to the city and to the nation. <laughs> I think the victims' families were taken back by that meeting where they found themselves almost confronted by residents as two separate factions. I empathize with you. I mean, can you imagine what's ahead of us? And so we're going to have to work together to be sure that whatever solution over the next five years we have to come to, it's going to preserve that bond amongst us. I'd like to know whether Battery Park itself has been considered. That's a, that's being... How would you all feel about Battery I'm, Park? I think it's a Battery Park was a solution that favored the residents. Below Battery Park City, it was farther away from the family's viewing platform, but it's a recreational area where no one lives. New York's new mayor, Bloomberg, liked the idea. I thought it should go in a historic Battery Park where you could look out, see the Statue of Liberty and the American flag in New York Harbor and uh, remind you that in the end, the attack on 9-11 was against America and against our ways of life. The mayor really held out an olive branch to these residents, and he actually showed them that he was trying to recognize their concerns as much as the victims' families. Who should have had control? The family should have had control over that. The rescue workers, the survivors, anyone who's involved should have had more control. But it wound up that the residents were the final decision makers on that. Location switched from Battery Park City to Battery Park itself. And so that's when we really got it going so that we could start measuring it up and getting the details finished and putting it all together. So this is the artist, this is Fritz Koenig. Fritz Koenig, the sculptor, came there uh, to look at it and actually helped us in terms of where some of the pieces were and how we would orient and put it back together. And he had in his hand a miniature model of the globe that he had all these years, I guess, and he held it up and he was showing us, you know, this is the way it went together and this is the way it was oriented, this is how it looked. This is a big eye, okay. and he's open. The long distance. Right, you want to look, look at the castle? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. She's open. Yeah. Right. But Our nature is to create, not deconstruct. There is heart in the work that we do at the site, but there was a whole lot of meaning in this because it was sort of putting something back together rather than taking it apart. World peace through free trade was the inspiration for the sphere which once stood at the World Trade Center. It survived the collapse of the Twin Towers, as did the idea that catalyzed its creation. I think the lessons that we can take away from the process of the temporary memorial are really good ones. We um, um, chose the element, we chose the location, and indeed, when different stakeholders were in the same room, they had different opinions, and we found a solution. And I think everyone's pretty happy with it. Unfortunately, with the temporary memorials, we didn't have any input. And we've learned that you really need to have constructive dialogue take place before they do anything. If 
we can do that properly, then there is no need to do um, any kind of human chain. But if we're not going to be heard for the permanent memorial, I'm not sure what that would mean. I can see this mad scene of people working, thriving, memorialized. I could just see this. I could just see Disney World. I really can. And it's so hard to see that that way. On the lowest level of the pit, firefighter Lee ILP made an unusual discovery. Wine bottles from the Marriott Vista Hotel had survived the collapse of the South Tower. Weeks earlier, ILP had recovered the remains of his own son, Jonathan, who was also a firefighter. 2,000. 270 victims were still unaccounted for. With all the debris now contained within the basement, the Department of Design and Construction reduced its role at Ground Zero. I get plenty of copies uh, after this. I got Dennis making a few dozen, so put a few on each table. We'll talk about Construction companies that had worked there since September took responsibility for coordinating day-to-day -day activities on the site. I wanted to talk a little bit about the excavation and the phasing drawings that I handed out. I've been in the construction industry since I was 15 years old. My dad was a jack of all trades. I've always said, hey, I would love to be the supervisor of the biggest job in the world. Somehow I got there, um, but it's not what you expected it to be. This was not the job I had in mind. Trucks and other machinery used two ramps to access the pit. They stretched precisely over the remains of the Twin Towers because debris here was the most compact. A cross section held back by the tower's structural steel reveals 14 floors compressed into eight feet. It was an area where recovery crews hoped to find many victims. A fireman's body was found underneath the ramp, right in line with the South Tower. And they wanted to get at it and, and to get it out because, you know, they just, that was a mentality. We found something we need to, we need to, we found a body, we need to retrieve it. Once you're finding one person from the fire department, they have numbers on their helmets and they have their names and their gear and we know that they're from a certain company. We know that they were with four or five other people from that company. We were hoping they were all going to be together. So once we found one, we would concentrate our efforts more heavily in that area. Firemen and police are, di are digging adjacent to one of the uh, roads here. And what we're a little concerned is that as they continue to dig deeper, they'll begin to undermine the road. The issue was that the ramp itself, it was the main ramp for debris removal out of the site. So we couldn't lose that ramp. I'm going to tell them what we discussed, to stop digging east of where we talked about. And Sam was saying, if you think what we're doing is going to undermine the ramp and compromise it in any way, then tell us to stop. And that's what we said. It's best to mark it, move your men out, and we'll get back to it later. It was a very, very hard decision at times to tell people that, okay, we've dug enough. We can't, we can't dig into the sides of this road anymore. We're going to compromise it. And I kind of rationalized that by them leaving the road intact, the unfortunate people that were underneath, they actually helped 
to gain access to everyone else. I just want to point out that there are areas spray painted out there of recovery areas where they know that they have bodies which we can't get until we alleviate some of the uh, debris on that pile. So I know everybody's wondering what all that spray paint is up there. That's a hot spot right now, so we're going to handle that area with kick gloves. The construction team designed a metal bridge to replace the debris ramps. That's where the bridge is going to start. It's going to come straight across, and there's four X's on that structure. It's going to cut through there. That's going to be our new road. So that'll allow us to be able to load, bring trucks in, load them up, get them out, and have access to the full site. Once that bridge came in, then we were able to dig into the road. And it was pretty productive. We were hoping we were going to find a lot more, but we found quite a few people. So um, that's a good thing. Inside the debris ramps were the crushed lobbies of both towers. The south debris ramp was expected to hold a greater number of firefighters, police officers, and other emergency workers since the south tower fell first without warning. Every time we found a recovery of a fireman or of a policeman, um, they were doing their job because um, you'd find civilians with them. It was very hard. We would just be uh, bringing people out left and right. In the end, the remains of nearly 70 people were recovered from the south ramp, the largest single find in the nine-month recovery effort. The closer you get to the site, the more aware you become of how daunting it is to contemplate rebuilding in such a place as that. But time is passing, and we will find, I'm confident, the right solutions on which to move forward. World Trade Center 7 had always been considered the starting point for rebuilding. Located north of the slurry wall, seven had been cleared faster than the rest of the site, and there had been no bodies to recover. Pelted by debris when the North Tower collapsed, seven burned until late afternoon, allowing occupants to evacuate to safety. I remember getting a call from the uh, fire department commander telling me that they were not sure they were going to be able to contain the fire. I said, you know, we've had such terrible loss of life. Maybe the smartest thing to do is, is pull it. Uh, and they made that decision to pull. And then we watched the building collapse. Seven had stood atop two electrical substations that were also destroyed. They had provided power to the World Trade Center and surrounding neighborhood. Before Seven was built, the eight-story substations stood bare at the site's northern edge. 
they blocked a direct approach to the Twin Towers from uptown via Greenwich Street. In 1980, nearly two decades before leasing the entire site, 49-year-old Larry Silverstein leased the parcel with the substations to build on top of them. We examined the substation and ended up recommending to the Port Authority that they allow us to build a two million square foot building on that site. And we proceeded to design it, engineer it, and then finance it and build it. Unfortunately, at the same time, it completed the blockage of Greenwich Street, which is coming here from the north and approaching the World Trade Center site, so that this community was even more completely cut off from neighborhoods to the south. When the building went down, my first reaction was, well, let's simply replicate what was there. Seven World Trade Center separated us all as a community, and without the building, all of a sudden, you could see everybody's neighborhood, and people did not want to see a building locking us from becoming a whole community again. I'm horrified that World Trade Center 7, which I considered the most ins insensitive to the site, is now slated to be the first one to be constructed, and probably the only one to be constructed as it originally stood. I think we really should take some time and look at this. The importance to slow Larry Silverstein down was to make sure that a building not be built to block Greenwich Street once again. Jobs must be created. Valuable square footage must be replaced. Mr. Silverstein's plan to not hesitate on the rebuilding of World Trade Center Building Number 7 will begin this process. Rightly or wrongly, the Pataki administration separated seven World Trade Center from the Twin Towers site itself. Absolutely. That's the important thing, that we don't have any delays at all. No lives were lost at this site. We had a great need to rebuild the substations to meet the power needs of Lower Manhattan when redevelopment occurs. This was the electrical substation for the power, the old, so the original substation over here. Well, this is uh, surprisingly in pretty good shape here. I knew that it would not interfere with the recovery effort and cleanup of the 16-acre site. I knew that it was important for us symbolically to demonstrate that we can rebuild. I think it will be a great sign for the future of Lower Manhattan if the Seven World Trade Center site especially can respond to community objectives and at the same time show the ability of New York to come back, rebuild, and reoccupy in new. Taylor's architectural firm made several designs for a building that would allow Greenwich Street to pass through, but would give up as little office space as possible. Silverstein presented them to the LMDC. First, there was a proposal uh, from the developer to create a great arch through the middle of the building so people could drive through or walk through. Mr. Garvin looked at our concept, and his first reaction was, you know, the building blocks Greenwich Street. Then the notion was the building could overhang Granite Street, and that too was unacceptable. Madeline Wills was in, she looked at it, she says, Granite Street. <laughs> it became obvious, uh, painfully obvious, that uh, we would be well advised uh, to be sensitive to the needs uh, of New York. If Larry becomes a problem for the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation, for the Port Authority, or for the people of New York, they could cut him loose and divide up the site among a variety of developers. So Larry went right back to the drawing board and came up with a new design to reestablish Greenwich Street. We had to figure out how to pull the core in, make it tighter. The only way you can make it tighter is by taking out an elevator bank. If you take out an elevator bank, you have to take out the floors, the bank of elevators services. We had to lop off the top 10 floors of the building. Instead of being a 2 million square foot building, it became a million 600,000 square foot building. What we're now looking at as a building that will enable Greenwich Street to move in a southerly direction, it does the trick and it works. This building is this very simple prism um, that would sit on this site, sitting back and letting that view corridor stretch all the way through 
binding together these two parts of the city that were really destroyed when the World Trade Center went in to block it. This building is completely dependent upon its site. It completely fits into the context of New York. Its building is the shape of the streets. And I think in that strong simplicity and clarity of this openness of this building will be a striking marker, more like the great obelisk leading into Luxor. It's the marker for the place of World Trade Center. Thank you. Thank you. say um, uh, that we are grateful uh, to Larry Silverstein, who showed uh, a lot of concern and interest and flexibility during this whole process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Like every developer in this city, Larry Silverstein does want to have a legacy. In slowing this process down, he's been able to think more about what his legacy could be by creating something that everyone wanted instead of what people would loathe. My hope is that in this process of deliberation and design, we create a vision so powerful that a sense of stewardship and collaboration will emerge in making the World Trade Center site come back to life. We say Billy for last, is today your last day? Today's last day. Today's Billy's last day. Billy's been here since uh, about a week after I got here. Um, he's been a right arm. Came a long way here, and I just want to say, Billy, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Cake and coffee at 11, booze at 9. <laughs> All right, guys, that's it. We'll see you out. It's a wholehearted effort down here that everybody has in bringing closure to this job site. That's all, folks. And uh, we will not give up till this job is recognized as having been completed in its recovery efforts, 100%. But we will not leave anything unturned here um, to satisfy every single person who has lost somebody here, or more important, every American uh, should know that this is what you do in America. In the final months at Ground Zero, construction workers and engineers adopted the tradition of firefighters and police officers. They performed the honor guard, but for recovered civilians. Gracious Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon them and upon their families. God bless them and God keep them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. On April 11th, seven months after the attack, they carried out the last civilians found at the site. One thousand seven hundred people, more than half of those murdered, had still not been identified. In the final weeks, firefighters and police officers sifted through thin piles of debris, desperately searching for the smallest of remains. A 30-foot steel beam that had once belonged to the South Tower remained standing. Construction workers would cut it down in a final ceremony on their last day of work. I don't think anybody that has worked at the World Trade Center can tell you that they haven't cried. It's just unprecedented what's happened down here and uh, something that you'll never forget. And it's incredibly sad, but 
hopefully uh, amongst all of us we'll all uh, get back to our normal lives. Something new is built here. I don't know if I ever have the guts to come back here. It's uh, every day I come here. It's like I don't know. It's, I lost something special here. I spent all this time there. It'd be hard to go back, for me anyway, to go have coffee or a dinner or something there. That would. That'd be kind of weird for me. I, I wouldn't get a good feeling about it. We are going to do everything in our power to make sure that we have the most beautiful memorial the world has ever seen. I want to know that I can lie down on the grass if I want to and have a moment of peace with my husband. rebuilt. I think the families will appreciate the importance of doing what we need to do if New York is going to be what it was before these attacks. done to the site. I hope that it conveys the horrible and tragic nature of what happened that day. Whatever's done there. If you would like to learn more about the work at Ground Zero, visit PBS online at pbs.org.
Funding for this program was provided by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, which seeks to enhance public understanding of the role of technology in society and portray the lives of the men and women engaged in scientific and technological pursuit. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Aunt Sophie. Happy birthday to you. Funding was also provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.